Hello, my name is Carmen and I am an avid cross-stitcher and I'm making this video because a week ago today, as I'm filming this, I got back home from a weekend in London, Ontario because I was an attendee at weekend two of Jacob Palooza, which is a cross-stitch retreat that was put on by Evertote and featuring uh, the designer Jakob de Graaf of Modern Folk Embroidery. And I had a very moving time there. Like I had, a, I, had a, I had a great weekend and I've been trying to find a way to document everything that I experienced because I don't want to forget anything or anyone. And, you know, I thought of writing it down, but it's hard to, you know, compare linen colors in a journal entry and it's hard to include video and photos in a journal entry. So I'm making it in video format. This is my little time capsule of my experience there. And, you know, I guess that means this is a floss tube. I wasn't really anticipating making a floss tube, but hey, if you can live vicariously through me, through everything that I'm gonna show, great. Uh, this video is going to include quite a bit of photos and videos that I took while I was there. I'm gonna be going over all of the activities that we uh, did over the weekend, and I'm also gonna be showing everything I bought. And um, I bought quite a bit of stuff. I don't have an LNS near me. I've never been to an LNS. I'd also never been to a retreat before, so this, was my first time being able to see linens, floss, charts. It's my first time to being able to be influenced by people who are right in front of me. <laughs> and I kind of allowed myself to to buy what I, what I wanted because I figured, hey, I'm not paying shipping, I'm here, right? I also stayed with a friend while I was there so I didn't have to pay for a hotel. So I saved money that way, right? That justifies how much I spent, right? Whatever, we're gonna move on to the fun stuff and I'll share a little bit about me along the way, but I won't bore you with that right now. So, I arrived on Thursday, was picked up by my friend who luckily had, so she lives in St. Thomas, which is just outside of London, and she had work to do in London every day of the retreat, so she was able to drive me there, which was amazing for me. Uh, but I kind of was on her schedule, so I didn't arrive right when the doors opened. I think I arrived like an hour and a half in. So actually it was kind of funny because as we were pulling in, there was a car in front of us that had Idaho plates and I kind of joked to my friend, oh, maybe that's Jan Hicks. I don't know how I knew she would have Idaho plates, but anyways, they pulled into the same conference center right in front of us and I saw a woman come out and I only really saw her from the back and she had a mask on, so I couldn't really see, but she had a big quilted bag with her. And I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's Jan Hicks. <laughs> so then we walk into the conference center and I'm like a few paces behind her. And I'm like, is that Jan Hicks? I think that might be Jan Hicks. And uh, yeah, we get to the, the front desk for registration and Hannah asks her, I just need your name. And she says, I'm Jan Hicks. So what do you know? I saw Jan Hicks. I was too shy to say hi to her, so I did not meet her. But <laughs> I was in the same room as her and that's not creepy at all that I'm talking about her right now. Anyways. Jan Hicks was there. And uh, so anyways, I went into the room and I didn't know anybody there. I had never met any of these people. Obviously I know who Jan Hicks is and I know who some of the personalities, you know, who are putting on the retreat are, but I've never met anybody. So it was definitely like first day of school jitters. I'm like, oh my God, I hope I make friends. I hope, I hope the cool kids like me. <laughs> um, but I figured I would just like find a table that had an empty seat and ask if I could sit there and it would be fine. But you know, it's like a little nerve wracking. So I walk in and I kind of turn a corner and I'm seeing all these tables that look pretty full. And then I hear a voice beside me that's like, hey, sit down, you can come sit with us. And I was just like immediately adopted into this table with five lovely ladies. Um, four of them came together from Sudbury. Uh, their names are Marlene, Suzanne, uh, Sandra and Tracy. Sandra and Tracy are actually sisters and they have, uh, I learned that they are part of a needlework group, a stitchy group in Sudbury called the Northern Needleworkers and I believe there are 13 of them and the four of them traveled down together and sat together and uh, they just like adopted me into, the, onto, into their table. And there was a fifth woman there who was not part of the group. She also was a uh, 
lonely orphan like me who came in without knowing anybody. And her name is Tracy. Sorry, her name is Nancy. Tracy is one of the women from Sudbury. Her name is Nancy and she came from Maine. So it was the six of us at the table and they had brought all sorts of like little gifts and I got, you know, some chocolates and I got like a little pouch to put things in and needle minder and uh, counting pins and skeins of DMC and all these little things. And I don't have a lot of like cross-stitch gadgets. So I appreciated having some of those things and I've been using them over the last few weeks. And uh, I felt kind of bad because I didn't bring any table gifts. I didn't bring any gifts except for the Smalls Exchange, which isn't really a gift because you're exchanging something. But anyways, I felt kind of bad because I didn't bring anything for anyone. But I, I was very appreciative of the gifts that I got and they were very generous and they were such lovely ladies. And I really feel like they made the experience for me. I mean, a lot of people there and a lot of things that happened there made the experience for me, but I feel like I really hit the jackpot with them and we all, you know, went out for dinner one night and we got along great and they just kind of, it felt like I knew them already. And yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm very grateful for, for those ladies. Um, they were great. Anyways, so I sat down and I have some notes here of everything that I want to talk about because there's a lot. <laughs> so, okay, so first uh, I will talk about what came in the package that they gave us. And so, okay, I'll start with the, I'll, I'll go from the, you know, the nice stuff to the amazing stuff. So, first of all, in the, in, in the, the little envelope that we got, there were two, I guess, folders, pamphlets, uh, little notebooks, or not notebooks, but just instruction manuals on the two workshops that we did on the second day of the retreat. So how to do an open ham, which I have gone ham on open hams since coming back, and I'll show you that a little bit later. And also how to stitch Frisian letters. It's more so how to design Frisian letters, uh, but I'll get more into that later. But these are excellent, excellent notebooks. And they're not notebooks, they're, what do you call this, like direction manuals? I don't know. They're really well done, they have nice pictures, they have different examples for the Frisian letters of how you can, how you can do them, and I will be treasuring these. Super, super well done, I'm very impressed. So there was that, and then there was also, and I was very excited about this because I've never had uh, like a floss bed before, but there's a floss bed that was made with this really pretty fabric. They also had project bags made from this, as well as this needle minder, and I've never had a needle minder before. So that was very exciting for me, and I have been using it. And I've been using these, like these, what are they called? Cool Smart Magnets kind of as needle minders, and they work, you know, but this is a lot nicer. And also just the sound of a, of a metal needle hitting the metal needle minder makes this like click sound and it just, ooh, just feels so nice. <laughs> Anyways, so there was that and I have been using this every day since I got back. And then we also got some, uh, like a small piece of 32 count linen, which was what we used to uh, practice the open hem stitch, which I'll show you that later when I talk more about that. But we also got that, and then the pièce de résistance was the project. And I went for the big project, um, which is this Frisian sampler, which I had Jacob sign for me, which is very nice of him. He wrote, thank you so much, Carmen, for coming and sharing your amazing work. With love, Jacob. Anyways, I'll talk more about Jacob later, but this is, I mean, just like all of his charts, it's very very good very well made very easy to read and a whole page of history on it and I saw the antique because he brought a whole bunch of antiques that he had laid out on some tables in the front of the room so I saw the antique and I gotta say that the colors that Carrie dyed and that were put together are very true to the antique so this is the palette here um, I went for 46 count linen. I'll show the linen in just a moment. 
but this is the it's hard to like lay them all out so that you can actually see all of the colors I have a light in front of me because it's a very gloomy day outside and actually the sun is probably gonna be setting in the next hour or two so I don't have the best light but I have my stitching light in front of me and I messed around with the settings to try and make everything show up as true as possible but it's like a little bit hard <laughs> anyways um, these colors are I mean they're beautiful I don't think there's any other opinion on that they're really nice and they're very very true to the original and I feel like they're showing up a little bit brighter on camera it's hard to to get an idea of what they actually would look like but they're quite I was trying to think of a way to describe them and I almost found like they they're quite like dusty I mean dusty sounds like a bad descriptor like it's a not a good thing but they're they're maybe powdery is a better word they're not um, like bright in your face colors uh, but there's still a, a wide variety of colors in here so I think it's gonna be a very interesting stitch once I once I get to it so these are the colors oh I forgot to mention that also in our in our goodie bag we got one skein of just navy and I think you were meant to use this for the open hand stitch but I I didn't want to waste it so I just used some DMC that I had brought with me um, so yeah so those are all the, the the flosses that I got and lastly we got a piece of linen obviously because we had it you got to stitch on something so this is a new linen uh, called speculas and I went for 46 count and hold on where is it I did actually start this project while I was there it's hard to find <laughs> Okay, here it is. I made the teeny tiniest little start, which you probably can't really see because it's sort of tone on tone, but I just put the first two letters of the alphabet. I don't know when I'll get to the rest of it. I don't like to have a lot of whips going at once, so I, I would prefer to finish the things that I already have going before I start this, but I just wanted the satisfaction of being able to say, I started this at the Jacob Palooza retreat and Jacob was in the room as I put these two letters in. So I did, I did do the teeny tiniest little start, but this linen is new to the Roxy Floss range and I think it's my favorite linen that, that she has ever dyed. It is um, quite similar to Panettone, I would say. I'm looking forward to whenever Carrie and Caroline are able to make a video on the uh, notes from the workshop page because I'm sure that they will talk about this linen and I'm not an expert in color theory but I feel like it's like if you are familiar with Panettone and actually I have some 40 count Panettone here that I bought later um, but it's it's kind of similar to Panettone of course this is 46 count the Speculas so it's not exactly the same and it's a little hard to tell on camera but I would say that the Panettone is like a bit more brown and the Speculas is a bit more gray. And maybe the Speculas is slightly lighter and slightly leaning on the cooler side and Panettone is slightly warmer, but they're both, they're both neutrals. But anyways, Carrie and Caroline will probably have smarter ways of talking about it, but they are quite similar. So if you know and love Panettone, Speculas will probably be uh, an interesting option for you too. And I think I actually prefer it. And Speculas is a Dutch cookie. Um, I grew up eating it. I am Dutch on my mother's side. And when I went shopping, I wanted to buy some more of it because I was like, this is so pretty. What is this? Um, and actually Shiloh of Xstitch MD was talking to Daniel who works for Evertote and he was telling her how to pronounce it. And I thought he was like pulling her leg or something because he was saying it was like, Speculatius or something um, and anyways turns out that's how you say it in German in Germany and then in Belgium it's it's called Speculoos and to me Speculoos is like the cookie butter spread um, but I guess that's just how you say Speculas in Belgium but I'm gonna call it Speculas because I'm Dutch and that's what I've been calling it my entire life and it's a really 
delicious cookie, by the way. It's like a, it's kind of like gingerbread, uh, spice wise, it's like a spicy cookie. And uh, you often will make it in like these wooden carved molds. And, uh, but you can also just make it not in a fancy mold. <laughs> My mom makes something called Rule de Spéculas, which is almost like a blondie or a brownie where it's like more cakey consistency. So there's a layer of the Spéculas cake cookie and then a layer of marzipan and then another layer of the speculas. It's so good. Oh my goodness. Anyways, I gotta get that recipe from my mom. All that to say, beautiful linen, delicious cookie. Highly recommend eating it. Don't eat the linen though. That would be a waste of linen. So that's the kit. That's what everything came with. Um, I like these colors. I don't know if you can tell, but I like these colors. They're beautiful. And I will be, it, it's the fact that I was able to see the antique makes it so much more meaningful. Cause like I was in the room with the original and he did talk about this quite a bit. It was stitched by a mother and a daughter. And he explained, and I imagine that some of that description is probably in here, but explained how he was able to determine that based off of initials of siblings that are kind of hidden throughout in different years and uh, I, I really really appreciate that Jacob puts in all of that information and it makes it so much more personal when you actually get to stitching it because you actually know something about them and maybe you can relate to them or connect to them in some way so that'll be very fun once I get to it for real not just the first two letters of the alphabet but you know the actual meat and potatoes of the sampler so that is what came in the kit so now I'm going to talk about the things that I bought on day one and spoiler alert I bought things on day two and day three as well so my haul is going to be split up into three chunks but my biggest chunk was on day one I knew that I wanted to buy linen when I was there because I have bought linen online obviously um, and it's just I've bought a lot of linen over the past year that was a lot more green than I was expecting. Now, I don't know if that's like a common thing, but whatever. So, of course, I bought some more speculas. And by the time I got there, uh, they didn't have a lot left. And they didn't have like your typical size cuts. So, I got a piece of 40 count speculas this time which is 15 by 26 inches. So not quite a, a quarter, but this is what it looks like. And there's quite a bit more modeling in this pic in this piece than what I had from the uh, 46 count. So a lot more of these darker splotches, if I compare it, um, this one is the 46 count. It's quite a bit lighter, I find, um, but equally beautiful. Anyways, actually on camera, this one looks quite different, but in real life, they look the same color. That's weird how that happens. Anyways, so I got a piece of that and I already know what I'm going to stitch on it. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, <laughs> but, uh, whenever they have like a lot of stock of it, this is one of those linens that I want to have like a half yard of. It's a great neutral and like all of the floss packs that I have acquired over the last week, <laughs> everything looked beautiful on this and I kind of want to stitch everything on it anyways so I got a piece of 40 count kind of an odd cut but nonetheless I have some so it'll keep me busy for a while I also got a piece of snickerdoodle also in 40 count and a quarter yard and this is one of those linens that I've seen on their website and I've often thought that looks so cool but I just I just don't know and yeah, seeing it in person was like, okay, I do know. And the answer is yes, I want it. So I don't know exactly what I'll stitch on this. It's not as dark in real life as it's showing up. But I think Snickerdoodle is a great name for it. Another cookie. Because of these like splotches of, in real life, it looks like it's a, it's like over dyed with a, with a orange or something. I, I don't know how exactly it's made, but you see different colors in it and it looks like spices and snickerdoodles at least when I've made them you like roll them in like some cinnamon and sugar right so it kind of looks like there's this is the cinnamon and sugar that's on top <laughs> anyways I, I 
I like the name of this linen. I feel like it's very appropriate and it's really pretty. And I've been thinking of buying it for quite some time and I finally got it. The third linen that I got, <laughs> this one, it was a one of a kind. It's called Caramel Brownie, also in 40 count. I have no idea what I'll stitch on this. It's very dark, but it's so pretty. It was one of those ones where I saw it and I was just like, oh, I just want to wrap myself in it. It's so, so, so pretty. And I feel like this would be a really pretty, uh, like monochromatic, monochromatic piece. I can think of a lot of, a lot of Jacob charts that would look really nice on this with like some kind of an ecru or a white or like a very pale brown, medium brown even because it's so dark. But it, it's a, uh, it has like a greenish undertone, I would say. So anyways, beautiful piece of linen. Oop, I might be holding on to this for a little bit because I don't have an immediate idea of what I would stitch on it. But I'm very glad to have it in my stash and this is officially the darkest piece of linen that I own. Now the last piece of linen I got on day one <laughs> is this and this is 46 count and it is unnamed. So I saw it, immediately picked it up and was like this is special and I asked Carrie because it didn't have a label on it I asked her does this have a name and she said no it doesn't but it's repeatable like I have the recipe for it and she she seemed to kind of poo-poo this linen. She, I guess she's not really into yellows. It's actually showing a lot more green on camera, but it's a bit more neutral than what it's showing up and uh, has a little bit of a beiginess to it. And I think this is a great linen. And immediately when I when I picked it up, I it reminded me of um, Vintage Buttercream by Lakeside. And I've only stitched on that once. And I, I got it as a kit, as part of a kit from Country Sampler. So I have that sampler here that I'll show just to compare the linen. So this is Mary Oakley by P Pineberry Lane. And obviously I didn't have this with me, so I couldn't, I just, from my memory, I was like, oh, that reminds me of Vintage Buttercream. Now, coming home and comparing them, Vintage Buttercream is a lot more beige. It's not as bright as as Carrie's li linen, but it's still in the you know the yellow world. Um, so I just wanted to show that to compare. And then I have another linen that I bought kind of not by accident, but it wasn't exactly what I was expecting. So this is uh, 46 count autumn gold by XJU Designs, and it's like one of those things where. On, the, on, on my phone or on my tablet or my laptop. It just, it didn't look quite as bright yellow. And I got this and was like, oh, and I have a half yard of it. And I was gonna stitch uh, the big Firlanda sampler on it, which you can see over there. And I'll talk about that shortly. But uh, it was just way more yellow than I was expecting. However, compared to Carrie's, it is, well, yeah, compared to Carrie's, it is very, very yellow and bright. And this is frustrating because it really, my, my light in my camera is not showing these true at all. Maybe that's a little bit better. But yeah, Carrie's, which is this lower one, is not as bright as XJU. If anyone has an idea of what I could stitch on this, I pretty much stitch samplers. And this, this, this color intimidates me a little bit. Anyways, and this linen also made me think of Hands Across the Sea because I... I've never actually stitched any of their designs, but I do have a few of their patterns and I've perused the website many, many times. And I feel like a lot of their models are stitched on very yellow looking linens. Example, Lucy Barber, which I have. This is uh, an exclusive with traditional stitches. And again, like that, does that not look kind of yellow to me? To you, sorry? I find it looks very similar to this. And I'm pretty sure this is like Wood Smoke by Tabby Cat. I've never seen that linen in real life, so I couldn't, couldn't really tell you to compare it. But I feel like that sampler could be done on this. And there are also a bunch of red samplers that they have on their website that are also done on what appear to be very yellow linens to me. And I could see a red sampler on this, maybe like an orangey red, a very warm red. Anyways, I have lots of ideas of what could be done with this linen um 
not sure exactly what I'll use it for. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know if other people are into yellow linens. Because I am. I don't know, maybe... Kara didn't seem as enthusiastic about it as as I was. So I was like, oh my, am I weird? Is this, is this, do other people like this? I think this is great. I, I hope she repeats it. It's, it's a great yellow. <laughs> anyway, so those are the four linens I got. But of course I didn't just get linen. I also got one skein <laughs> of floss on that day. This is Green and Barrett. It might seem weird to just get one skein of floss, but I have used Green and Barrett before for a conversion I did that I will show later. It's in my pile of finishes that I'm going to show. And it's a very, very, very dark green. Like this kind of looks black right now. And the truth is in person, it kind of looks black too. But then when you really look at it and you have the light on it, it's like, oh wait, no, that's green. So I've been wanting to do a black sampler in Green and Barrett on a light linen because then it'll look black but when you really look at it it has the secret and the secret is that it's green <laughs> anyway so I already had some at home but I didn't have enough to do a whole sampler so I got another I got another skein um, also I bought a needle minder and this I think this was part of some kind of like exclusive kit uh, a few years ago, but they had them for sale and Caroline had mentioned that they would have them for sale. I don't know if these will ever be sold again and I just have seen it online over the past year and every time I see it, it gives me a little giggle because that's Jacob with a needle <laughs> and I just think it's kind of silly and great. So I have that now too. And lastly, I got some charts. So um, I got Joan Sands and he brought the he brought the antique of this as well as his own stitching because on the last day he showed his own stitching and it was really cool to be able to see the original antique and the and the the stitched model that he had done of course i bought this before i saw either of those but of course i have to do this this is like a classic jacob chart anyway so i bought that i got this pattern Katrine and William or Willem no William um, and I don't know when I'll stitch this but I will probably stitch this version that has the alphabets and just I don't know feels very complete to me that's another uh, new-ish design of his actually I think it's very new I think he just released it now that I think about it and then the most exciting chart that I bought on that day was this one which is the red stag among roses so I have yet to stitch a red stag sampler, but I really like them. I think my very favorite sampler of all time is the GGR uh, Red Deer sampler. And actually he talked about that sampler uh, in the talk that he gave later that day um, because he actually bought an antique that is almost identical to it. And he showed it and immediately when he showed it, I was like, oh, that's Red Deer from GGR. Um, and then he told the story that he had like shown it to some people and they were like, uh, that's not because he just bought an antique and he didn't know about Red Deer Sampler yet. And, uh, so I thought, oh no, did he buy like a reproduction? Like somebody restitched it and sold it and pretended it was an antique, but no, it actually was an antique and, uh, it is a little bit different. He showed side by side pictures of what he had bought and GGRs and GGR uses the, uh, picture of the antique in there uh, like on the front of the chart so you can actually see the antique that GGR has and um, yeah it's a little bit different the name is different it uses the same alphabet uh, it's like the same font I guess and there were also a couple of little details like some colors were a little different but essentially it was the exact same sampler and he was able to this is all from memory by the way so I might be like getting a couple of details wrong but from what I remember he was able to determine or hypothesize with some degree of certainty that the one that he had bought was the teacher of the girl who stitched the GGR version. And he was able to figure that out based off the ages of the people. And he was talking about how he can't really, you know, reproduce his anymore because it would like kind of take away from her sales, but he thought it would be cool if they could be stitched alongside each other. 
And he also talked about how it would be so nice to get both of the antiques in the same room, kind of reunite them in that way. Anyways, that's really special. So I guess, I guess they were, both of those samplers were based off of some kind of model or pattern and were stitched uh, around the same time by people who probably knew each other, which is, uh, it's like, again, the, the history. Once you know a little bit about the story of these people, it becomes so much more personal. And it's, it's amazing that he has another version of that incredible sampler. And maybe there are more versions out there that we just don't know about in somebody's personal collection somewhere. Anyways, that is all the stuff I bought. After I paid for all of this stuff, I, I ran into Caroline and I had never, you know, met her or talked to her in real life before. And then I, so I saw her and I was like, hey Caroline, I have to show you something because uh, maybe about a month ago on the Evertote YouTube channel, her and Carrie started a new segment in their videos that they have named the Roxy Hall of Fame, where people can submit photos of their finishes where they used a Roxy Floss conversion. And so they announced that and I was like, well, I have one that I would like to submit. So I sent it and it's the In the Garden of Holland, again, a modern folk embroidery chart. <laughs> And she and I mentioned in my email that I would be a weekend too, and she said in the video like, "Well, please bring it because I want to I want to look at it." So when I saw her, I was like, "I have to show you this thing," and of course she's like, "Who are you?" <laughs> she's, but I told her, and she's like, "Well, you should put it on the brag table," and I didn't know there was a brag table, so I put it on the brag table along with my other finishes, which is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to show you my finished modern folk embroidery pieces that I put on the brag table. So I'll start with In the Garden of Holland. So this is In the Garden of Holland by Modern Folk Embroidery. And this is a conversion I made from Roxy Floss and I changed a lot of the colors. I will insert a picture of the model that Jacob has on his website on screen so that you can compare colors and I brightened a lot of the colors up and I also changed some completely. So in his version there's a lot of browns and I suspect that he used the colors from the front of the antique but it also had a lot of pinks and there was some brightness to it and I felt like, I don't know, I did it this spring and I was just feeling very optimistic and colorful and so I went on the website and did my best to choose colors and this is what I came up with. And I'm, this is something I'm like very proud of because I kind of feel like I had a bit of creative input in it as well. And anyways, if anyone wants the conversion to this, I'm happy to give it to you. Um, they have their own conversion on the website, on the Evertote website, but it's truer to the original that Jacob, it's like truer to the D DMC that J Jacob calls for. But if you want this one, I am happy to give it to you Shiloh saw this and then found me later and asked me for the conversion and I told it to her and she bought all the flosses and she's going to stitch it this way, which is like, oh my goodness, what a big honor. <laughs> like, what a huge compliment that the Shiloh wants to stitch her own version of my conversion. Like I, I, that's like such a big compliment. I can't, anyway, it's great. So she, I think there were a couple of flosses that they didn't have, so she had to change a couple of things. And she chose a different linen. I think she might have chosen lentil. It was a bit greener. But actually, I think her version will look really good because there's a bit of tone on tone where, like the angels, for example, on top. When you look at it, you can see them, but from far away, it, it is kind of hidden. There's also some little animals that are on the houses that, well, it's getting very washed out right now because of my light but those are also kind of tone on tone. And personally, I, I really like tone on tone because I feel like it forces you to interact with the sampler in a different kind of way. Like you see, you see a sampler when you're this far away from it, and then you see all this extra detail when you're close to it. And yeah, it like forces you to view it in a different kind of way. Like look at this motif, it's like, you wouldn't even notice that it's there from far away. And then you step a little closer and it's like, oh, there's even more than I thought. So yeah, that's my In the Garden of Holland. 
that I did this past spring. So that went on the brag table. Next, next I will show, I'll show this. So this is the Swedish Folk Cushion. And this I stitched on 40 count sand by Fiber on Win. I was mentioning earlier that I've bought a lot of linens that are a lot more green than I thought they were gonna be. This is one. And it's actually so green that I think it might have been mislabeled. Like it's, cause it was supposed to be brown, I think. I, I'll check, but it, anyways, I do really like the color. It was just not what I was expecting at all. And this is stitched with Spa d'Alger of Ovara Spa. It's the first and to date, the only time I've stitched with that silk. Um, and I actually, if I'm being honest, I think this is my favorite thing that I've stitched this year. It's maybe not the flashiest thing, but I loved making this and I love the colors together. And it's just so, I love this man's pantaloons. Look at those pants. There are so many things in Jacob's charts and also a lot of the antiques where the guys are wearing these funky pants and I, <laughs> I love it. It's so cute. Anyways, this, I actually wanted to talk about this because this is an older pattern of Jacob's and I feel like people sleep on some of his older patterns. Like, obviously I think it's normal that there would be maybe a bit more excitement for the new thing that comes out because we haven't seen it yet and a lot of people are stitching it and then you get to, you know, maybe participate in a stitch along or if there are, if there's something like his stitch alongs where you can choose your own colors, it's fun to see what other people are doing. But there are some, there are some sleepers, I think, in his older patterns that I never really see people stitching. However, again, Shiloh, um, in her recent videos, she, she changed the samplers that are behind her, and she has this behind her, but she has it stitched, um, I forget what the linen color is, but it's like an ecru uh, that she used for the stitching, and she, I was talking to her about it, and she stitched it, I think, two over two on 25 count. And it's so much bigger. The first time I saw that, I did talk to her about it later, but I saw it in her videos before we met. Um, I, I saw it and I recognized it and I was like, what is that? And I was like, oh my God, I've stitched that. It just somehow in the different colors and the different size, I almost didn't recognize it immediately. And I only stitched this like six months ago. So it's not like I would have forgotten it by now, but anyways, a few people actually, when they saw my finish, they were interested in stitching it themselves. So that's again, like such a big compliment, but also a big compliment to Jacob that he's consistently been putting out great patterns for years. Like I think this came out like 10 years ago or something. It's not a new pattern, but you can get it on his website. I think it's like six euros or something. It's really not very expensive at all. And the next one I'm going to show is so when Jacob put out his gigantic Freelander sampler, he also put out some smaller ones. Of course, when I saw the big one, I wanted to stitch it right away and I wanted to stitch it on 46 count and I wanted to stitch it with silk. So I had to wait for the materials to come. But in the meantime, I needed to like address, I needed my fix of, of a Freelander sampler. So I, I stitched his uh, medium Freelander that with materials that I had in stash just to you know keep me going. So this is his medium Freelander. I stitched this on porcelain 40 count with chalkboard which is the coolest black ever because it's kind of gray and it has a green undertone and I've stitched with it a few times now and I love 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 that color. That's like definitely in my top five favorites in the Roxy Floss line on a scrap piece of porcelain. Actually, this was the off cut from the piece that I had used for in the Garden of Sample, uh, sorry, in the Garden of Holland sampler. So that went up there too. I started stitching this the day it came out and I think I finished it like in a few days because I, I, I just obsessively worked on it when it came out. Anyways, so that's that. Um, and then I do have one other finish, but I didn't put it on the brag table just because there are, it's, I'm giving it away and it has some people's names on it and I, 
I don't know, just for their privacy, I felt a little bit weird and I've actually covered up their names with some scrap linen, which is why, why there's that <laughs> happening. But this is his AIO 1844, I think. I don't remember the year. Um, and it's a honing and sampler. And I did quite a lot of changes to it. I personalized it. So this is being given away to somebody I know who last year uh, had a huge year and lost a child and had a child. So it's kind of a birth and a memorial sampler. And the animals on top, I designed those. I'm particularly proud of the loon and they're all, they represent the family members and there's the date of birth and then I just covered their names. Um, but the rest of it is a honing and sampler. And I actually, this was the first reproduction sampler that I had done and I finished it in January and I still haven't mailed it to her. <laughs> I just haven't been able to like let it go. I, uh, I just, anyways. I got a picture with with Jacob and I told him about this and I you know I showed it to the designer I'm now showing it on a floss tube and I think I'm finally ready to mail it off to the person it was intended for but I mean I still have the pattern and I would like to stitch this myself the like the original reproduction I wouldn't stitch it this way but I, I would like to stitch this again so this was stitched on 36 count dirty porcelain um, one over two with again chalkboard and the red is phthalo red which again is one of my favorites from the roxy line and even though i much prefer stitching on 40 count i do like how sparse it looks on 36. i think you would still get a bit of that effect on 40 um especially if you're stitching black on a white but I, I like how lacy it looks and how it almost looks more fragile when you can see the linen through the X's. I know some people don't like that and they prefer a better coverage, but I, I quite like this. Um, and it's gonna be hard to let go of this. And also the fact that it was my first sampler, <laughs> like maybe my first sampler should have been for me and my second sampler could have been a gift, but it's fine. I've stitched plenty of samplers since then and I think I'm ready. To let it go so that's my other finish that i brought um another finish that i have that i didn't put on the brag table is this so this is the hanseatic pin pillow um by modern folk embroidery and this is another one of his designs that i think it came out in 2015 and i just don't really see people online stitching it but it's a wonderful wonderful pattern um there's a lot of stitching in here I this was my first time stitching on linen, and actually it was my first time stitching modern folk embroidery. So I stitched this at the end of last year, so I put 2022 at the bottom, and I used 3777 on 32 count flax, just a plain, plain linen by Zweigart, two over two. And I watched some tutorials online on how to make a this cornu and figured it out, and so that I also have that. And I just realized that I never actually showed you my whips. So I brought two whips with me, which are actually my only two whips because I'm pretty much a monogamous stitcher. I find it quite overwhelming to have many things going at once. So I'll start with the, the one I'm less excited of, of the two. And that is the stitch along for the year. Now I didn't actually work on this while I was there. I worked on it a little bit on the train on my way over but I felt self-conscious because I felt like I was taking up too much room and there was somebody sitting next to me, so I didn't really do much work on it, but I have worked on it since I got home. So, and I left it in my scrolls because I, I'm not quite done October's portion. I just need to fill that out and then October will be done. But yeah, this is the 2023 Stitch Along. Now I am stitching this on 36 count, two over two. And I started this in January and I, I started stitching again pretty much a year ago, almost to the day. And I learned when I was a kid, my aunt taught me how to do it. And then once I was in high school, I was too cool for school. So I stopped and then a year ago, I, I, I wanted to make some ornaments for some of my colleagues and I 
just uh, like I started stitching and then I found patterns and then I just like I went down a rabbit hole and I haven't come out of the hole yet and I think I'm quite good in this hole I'll stay here anyways so in the beginning of the year I did a lot more experimenting with different counts and stuff I didn't know exactly what I liked I've since learned that I like 40 and 46 count. I've never stitched on anything higher. I'd be interested in trying that. Uh, I don't own any kind of magnification tools, so maybe I would need that for like 50 or 56 count. I don't know. I'm okay for 46 for now. Maybe in a few years I won't be. I don't know. Um, but anyways, so I, I bought 36 count linen and I used Ecru and 294 DMC, two strands over two. And I've since learned that I do not uh, prefer stitching with two strands of threads. <laughs> but you know, at this point I'm not gonna start it over, so I'm just kind of dealing with it. I also learned that stitch alongs are probably not for me <laughs> because in the beginning of the year, I found it so difficult to stop every month. Like I was so excited about this pattern that I wanted to keep going, but like, you know, I'd done my 4,000 stitches when I got to this point. And I wasn't allowed to stitch anymore until February and I had that feeling for the first few months where it was it was frustrating for me to like feel like I needed to stop and of course like there are no rules you don't have to do that but I'm kind of neurotic and once I decide I'm gonna do something some way like I, I have to do it that way <laughs> so I wasn't able to just stitch it at my own pace and then later in the year I had kind of the opposite pro problem where I understood that 36 with two strands was not really for me. And also I'd stopped and started so much that it, I wasn't as excited to get back to it. Cause then I kind of felt like I would get into a flow and then right when I would get into the flow it was time to stop and like stopping and starting kind of like removed some of the joy for me. Anyways, I have stuck with it anyways, just cause again, I'm a rule follower and those are the rules that I decided I was gonna follow. But we're almost done, we're almost at the end, and I love how it looks. Um, I like how two strands looks when it's done. Um, I find my stitches don't look quite as nice, and I also find on 36 count it's hard for like my tension, like you can pull the thread and, and the, the, the linen threads will get warped and you have to be a bit more careful. I actually find it much easier to stitch on 40 and 46 count because it's a tighter weave. That's just me, but I do love how it looks. And I'm really excited to see this completed because I think, I think it's going to be beautiful. And I'm actually thinking that I will probably finish it with a hem stitch, which I learned how to do this weekend. And it seems very appropriate for a modern folk embroidery pattern. And my other whip, and this is what I worked on the whole time that I was there, is the big Firlanda sampler. So this is AKGIT. What is it? 1833. Akit. That's not what her name was. Anyways, while I was there, I stitched... Uh, ooh, this is kind of hard to do. So I stitched this motif. Uh, I stitched like all of this area. And I really, really, really wanted to be able to stitch the name and the year while I was there. And I did manage to do that, so I'm pretty happy. And this is pretty much the halfway point on this, on this pattern. So once I finish this motif, there's another small one that goes underneath it. And then I'll be done page 10. And there are 20 pages. However, I've already gone past those first 10 pages because these motifs are on the following pages. So I'm pretty sure I'm already past the 50% point. I don't use Pattern Keeper, so I, I don't really have any way of knowing for sure how, how far along I am. but. Yeah, I'm done this. And also Jacob brought his own version of it, which he hasn't completed. He has a, just about the same amount done. And his is on an even finer count. Oh yeah, so this is 46 count light hazelnut um, by XJU. And the, the floss is NPI silk um, 993, I believe. It could be 998. They have two blacks. It's the blacker, it's the darker of the two blacks. I think it's 993. Anyways, and this is such a breathtaking sampler. I mean, look at that. There's so much going on. Like you see it from far. Again, it's a thing like almost like tone on tone when there's so much detail, it's the same effect. From far, you just see like all these black blobs. <laughs> 
But then you get closer and you see there's so much detail in here. This is my favorite tree. There's deers in it, in the tree. And then the other ones, somebody told me, someone at my table, I think it was, I think it was Suzanne, said that this looked like an owl. So that like, these are the eyes, this is the beak, these are the wings, and I kind of see it. Somebody else said it looked like a skull. I don't know, it's kind of like those ink blots. But also like, there's so many little birds hidden everywhere. There's so much detail in here. Every time I look at it, I see something different. It's so beautiful and I still have half left to stitch. So how fun is that? <sighs> this is like the crown jewels of my stitching collection right now. And it's not even done yet. So I'm gonna leave that here so I can keep looking at it as I continue to film this video because it's just so nice. And I ironed it today for this video. I, I hadn't ironed it before and it now looks even better than it did. <laughs> I guess it's maybe a little presumptuous to compliment your own stitching, but I don't care. It's beautiful, okay? <laughs> well, so I'm gonna insert in here some pictures of the brag table there were a lot of people who were buying charts based off of other people's finishes, which I think is so cool and so sweet and almost feels like a collaborative effort. The next thing I'm going to talk about was kind of like, if I had one thing to take away from this retreat, it would be this first lecture that Jacob gave. So he gave a, I think it was about an hour long, a talk about samplers and specifically Dutch samplers. And it was during that lecture that he showed his his uh, red deer version of red deer that he had bought um, and he showed some samplers from Friesland and Honingen which are two northern provinces in the Netherlands um, and then at the very end of his lecture he showed a picture of a very small sampler from Drenthe and here's where I'm going to talk a little bit more about myself so I am Dutch on my mom's side I have Dutch citizenship. I lived in the Netherlands for half a decade, and my family is from Drenthe. Drenthe borders with Groningen and Friesland. It's one of the northern provinces. And I really had just one question that I wanted to be able to ask Jacob over the weekend. And that question was, why are there no Drenthe samplers? I've never in my life seen one. And I've even like Googled it, like I've tried to find, I Googled Dutch or Drenthe sampler and like nothing really comes up. But there's so many from these neighboring provinces of Groningen and Friesland. So I wanted to know, like, is there just like not a needlework tradition there? I mentioned that my aunt taught me how to cross stitch, but she didn't learn it from her mom. I think my Oma did know how to cross stitch, but she, she was a seamstress, so she definitely had needleworking skills. But um, my aunt learned to cross stitch from a very, very close family friend uh, called Bauke, who's actually from Friesland, which is where Jacob is from, and where the like the project that I bought that I got as part of the uh, part of the retreat is from. And Bauke taught my aunt how to stitch, so I was curious, like, what's what's the deal? Why why are there none from Trenta? So I was like so excited when he showed this little sampler. It was like quite a humble sampler. And um, I'll insert some pictures as well of that. And after he was done his talk, there was an uh, opportunity for us to ask some questions. And eventually, I were, at this point, I hadn't met Jacob yet. So, you know, still the first day of school, still have some nerves. <laughs> so I eventually I did ask him and I asked him, you know, why I, this is the first time I've ever seen a sampler from Trente. So my question is, why is, is, is there not a, um, a tradition of needlework there? And if so, why are there none that are reproduced? And his answer was kind of like a little bit what I suspected. So the way he answered it is that he said that Drenthe was very, very poor province and that there are like two main reasons why there wouldn't be as many samplers from there. He did mention that there are Groningen uh, samplers that maybe are attributed to people from Honingen, but that were actually stitched in Drenthe because uh, there were some 
uh, rich farming families that also like they were from Groningen, but they did they did farming in Drenthe as well, I guess. But still, they were they were Groningen families from Groningen, and uh, yeah. So he said that they were very poor, and that there maybe wasn't as much time for the young girls to stitch a decorative item. Like if they were stitching anything, it was like more for practical reasons and they maybe wouldn't really be wasting linens and stuff on something that was non-essential. But not only that, they might not have really had time to spend making something like that because they, since they were so poor, they really needed to be like working on the farm all the time just to like keep afloat. And then he, the, he also said that another reason why there aren't as many is because they were poor, they didn't have access to like silks and cottons necessarily. Most of this would have been stitched uh, with wool and wool is notorious for getting eaten by moths and other bugs like that. So there may have been plenty of other samplers, but they just didn't survive because the materials were not ones that are good for having like a long life. They just don't exist anymore. Whereas something like silk lasts a very, very long time, but it's much more expensive. And in his slide, he had also um, shown a picture of a farm that would have been typical of where this girl would have lived. And I don't know, it was just like a little bit of a, a moment of reflection for me. I got like a little bit misty eyed um, because, I mean, I knew Drenthe was a very poor province. I don't think it, that is necessarily the case anymore today, um, but it's where my family is from and seeing a sampler from there for the first time was like very moving for me and it really made me think of, I guess, all of the things that my family had to live through even just like a few generations ago. So just so that they could survive, which in turn led to me existing. And it was a little bit surreal to be in this room like having taken time off work and you know just spending a bunch of money on linens and stuff to support a hobby while just a few generations ago my family was like just just surviving just surviving they were doing a lot of labor not work i see a difference between labor and work <laughs> they were doing a lot of labor to just just to exist so that you know a few generations later i can be in london ontario pursuing a hobby, like something so non-essential. And it just, I don't know, made me feel a lot of gratitude towards them and reminded me that, that had I been born 200 years ago, I would have been growing up in, in that humble farm in a small village in Drenthe. And actually like that's the origins of a lot of us. And I think we maybe get swept away by stories of like the more elite classes and stuff like that and I think that's you know normal to be interested in all that but at the end of the day most of us come from the farm in Drenthe or its equivalent and I don't know I just felt very grateful for my ancestors who I've never met and who I will never be able to thank so anyways it's a little bit about my family <laughs> Uh, my family uh, moved, or it's actually the same story on both sides of my family, they just came from different parts of Europe, but my mom's side of the family moved to southern Ontario after the Second World War, and there are a lot of Dutch people, uh, and people with Dutch heritage in southern Ontario, uh, and a lot of Dutch people settled there. And actually this is something I was talking to Shiloh about, because she had mentioned in her floss tube before going over that she... <laughs> she's Dutch on her mom's side and that they had arrived via Halifax. And that's exactly what happened in my family um, from different provinces. I think her family's from Zeeland, which is in the South. But anyways, I was talking to her about it. And then she mentioned her dad, who's Italian. I was just like, wait a second, my dad's Italian. Like, are we related? What's going on? Are we distant cousins? Anyway, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's a little bit my connection to Dutch samplers. Um, Anyway, so after that, we had the opportunity to go to the front of the room and talk to Jacob and he had all of these antiques laid out and I took tons of pictures. Um, and you know, actually I'm gonna insert a short video that I took of the table of antiques right here. 
So yeah, that was really cool to be able to see all of those, especially like the project that I was about to start and, uh, you know, Joan Sands was there and a whole bunch of other ones and I did take some pictures and I'll include a little slideshow soon about that. But I, I managed to actually get to talk to Jacob a little bit and of course there were like a lot of people who were asking him questions so I, I didn't want to intrude too much but I asked him about, when I had a moment, I asked him about the, um, the Drense sampler and I got to talking a little bit about my family and I told him that you know we're, we're from Drenthe and I asked him like are you ever gonna reproduce this because oh my goodness it would mean so much to me to be able to stitch this pattern from the region my family's from like this is somebody I could be related to I mean I'm probably not related to her um, <laughs> but you know just there's a very deep personal connection there for me um, and he said, well, actually I have reproduced it, but there's a shop in Drenthe, a needle workshop that has uh, like the exclusive rights to it right now. And one day, I guess it'll be available on his website, I'm guessing. But I asked him, what, what is this shop? And it's called the Handwerk, Handwerk Boutique. It's in the north of Drenthe. And actually me and my mom are going to be going to the Netherlands in the spring. And we'll be going to Drenthe to visit some of the family and hopefully we can go to that shop and it would be so cool for me to buy it from from the shop itself. Um, I, I looked on their website and I think you can order it online, but if I can buy it in person, that would be pretty special. Anyways, so that's pretty cool. I'm happy that it exists. And he had also told me that um, I think there's a museum in Drenthe somewhere where there are four or five other samplers that were stitched by girls in Drenthe. So there are, there are Drenthe samplers out there. You know, they're just a little harder to find, but <sighs> anyways, I hope to find some more as, as the years go on. Cause I think this is a part of, uh, part of our heritage that, you know, is worth preserving. It's tough with poverty comes, uh, a lack of time and resources to be able to make pretty things that last generations. It's like one of the side effects of poverty. Um, that doesn't mean that they weren't artistic or creative. It just means that they didn't have the privilege of being able to make and preserve things like this. And so if there are samplers that have survived, that were made and did survive, I think it's so important to, you know, honor that at whatever way we can. Because even though, you know, maybe they came from humble be beginnings, those people really mattered. <laughs> like, they really mattered. If they didn't exist, I wouldn't exist. Anyways, I'll stop talking about that. But I also got to talking about Jacob, about Jacob. I started talking to Jacob about some of the antiques. And I had three favorites that I really, 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 really want him to reproduce. I'll put the first one here. There's a big boat in it. I think it's really funny that there's this like one little splotch of red stitches. Somebody was asking about, there's like a horse that's attached to the boat via this like string. And he was saying, well, that's the horse pulling the boat along the canal, <laughs> which I just think is really, really charming. Um, and then my second favorite was this red and green one. Super cool. He was explaining what all the little motifs in the bottom meant. There's like a bee skep there. There's somebody standing in front of a Dutch door. There's like a little cart with people in it. <laughs> it's so, so cute. And a lot of people were very interested in that one too. But then my number one favorite 
and apparently people were like bugging him all weekend like please reproduce this please reproduce this was it was very big but also if you really looked at it it, it was a, stitched on a very very fine linen so actually like if you were to stitch that on like 32 count it would be huge and it was oh it was just so beautiful and there were so many and like the pictures i took do not do justice at all and he was telling a story about how like it was glued to like a piece of wood and he had to like submerge it in water to like release it from the wood and he was like all scared that everything's gonna get ruined anyways it wasn't ruined um and he told me that a lot of people have been asking for him to reproduce it but he also said like i think some people might be underestimating how how big and involved it was there's a lot of specialty stitches in there um and it's and it's huge but there's these like little birds in the in the corners of the border and <sighs> i would really really like it if you were to reproduce that one. Oh my goodness uh anyway also like there were some that had girls and boys in them with these like red and black uniforms and again i'll i'll insert pictures of that and he was saying that that's the uniform that orphans in amsterdam would wear but that there were also maybe orphanages around the country that also used those uniforms really really cool bits of history that i learned just by able to be talking to him and um at some point somebody was asking about borders and he said that people would stitch borders for memory or like use those patterns to like stitch the cuffs on something for memory and somebody was asking like how can you do that without a pattern and he was saying well it's like you know knitting it becomes you just remember the patterns and you've done it a million times so you remember and then I kind of interjected because I was like oh or like playing an instrument you just remember where your fingers go because you've done it so many times and then when I was talking to him about where my family's from and stuff he was like are you a musician and it started a whole conversation about music I'm a musician, I play the cello, I have a job in an orchestra, um, and it's just something I've noticed about through watching Floss Tube, is that there are a lot of musicians who stitch, and he's like, he, he himself is a musician, he had an album there that was being sold, and has he has friends who are musicians, he was talking about his friend, cellist Caroline Lavelle, who I've been looking up, because I'm curious now, <laughs> and yeah, great love for music, obviously, if you've watched his videos, especially around Christmas time last year he like was writing his own songs and recording them it's this <laughs> big music lover and a very musically gifted person and Caroline used to be a flute teacher there's a lot of stitchers who are musically inclined and yeah and I think he was very excited when when he found out I was a musician we got to geek out over some music stuff anyways a question I also asked him while I was at the table that I wanted to mention because uh, he had one of the samplers that people were asking about he actually had I think he'd already charted it but he didn't want to release it yet because I think he hadn't finished all of the research for it yet and I asked him do you like withhold from publishing things because you haven't finished your research and it seems and the way he answered it seems that like the research seems almost as important to him as as the chart itself and it's something I really, really respect about designers who include history about the um, reproductions that they publish. Because for me, like that's, I, of course, it's nice to stitch a pretty thing. But if I know who the person was and what their life was like, it just, uh, like you, you relate to them so much more and you feel for them. And then you, it's not, you're not just making a pretty thing anymore. You're, you're connecting to this person, this human, and you're honoring them by recreating something that they made in their youth and I think that's so special <laughs> and I really really respect that he prioritizes this research and really wants to know who this person was and why does it matter and it's something I wanted to mention also because I bought this chart a few months ago from a different Dutch designer Sudide. Um, they have a few actually this is like a designer I kind of have my eye on because They've been putting out a few reproduction samplers in the last, I think, two years. And I am their Dutch, so obviously I'm like all about it. And uh, yeah, and I really like their designs. I actually started this and then realized that my piece of linen was only going to allow for, I think, like a centimeter margin, which is not really enough. So I had to stop it, but I do really want to stitch this soon. This is another Honingen sampler. And the reason why I mention it is that 
once you look at it, the very first page has a little blip of history on, on the girl. And at the very bottom, it says, from Mr. J. de Graaf, I received extensive information about the history. You can read this on my blog. And then she puts the link to, <laughs> to the blog. So Jacob even is doing research for other designers. <laughs> like, that's so cool. I love that. It's also like very supportive. And I think the, the preservation of heritage seems to be something that's important to him. And it's really important to me too. And yeah, I, I really, really admire him. I think the work he does is, it's fun because we get to stitch these pretty things, but it also like heritage wise and culture wise, I think it's so important. And I'm so grateful that there are people like him, but also Sudi Day that are, that are preserving that in a way, in such a fun way, because then I get to remake this. Like look how pretty that is. And it's not too big either. Anyways, and it's also a very nice chart. And yeah, I should stitch this like ASAP because I even started it and I had to stop because my linen wasn't the right size. Oh. Anyways, I think that's all for day one. I'm going to insert a slideshow of more close-up pictures of all of the antiques and I'll be back to talk about day two. Okay, so I've just had to pause recording for a moment because on day two, I arrived and there was an ornament waiting for me at my table. And I know I have it somewhere, but I cannot find it. So if I happen to find it before this video goes up, I'll insert a picture on screen. But anyways, we're gonna move on. On day two, I arrived again a little bit later than most people just because I, my friend was giving me a ride and that was when she was able to bring me and yeah there was an ornament waiting for me and I found out that somebody at the retreat had stitched an ornament for everybody there a whole ornament finished with beads and everything and everyone at my table had one and I had one just like sitting there waiting for me which is incredible and I found out her name was Karen and I will talk about Karen in just a moment because we have a very interesting story about her and I. And then we did the Smalls Exchange. So first, the Smalls Exchange, I had made a pin pillow, like this this one that I just showed earlier. And I did take some pictures of it before I gave it away. And I have pictures of it with this one so you can see with size comparison. This one that I have here is a 32 count and what I stitched was 42 count. Sorry, 40 count. And I stitched that on like this mystery even weave that I had bought right when I first started stitching. Um, and actually I have it stitched here as well because I am going to, obviously I haven't finished it into a pillow yet, but this is going to my mom. It was actually her 60th birthday yesterday. So the only difference is on the one that I gave away, it said 2023 and this one says 1963 for my mom. But yeah, this is again, the Hanseatic pin pillow. There's a lot of stitching in this. <laughs> I have now stitched this four times. Um, it's beautiful, it makes such a great gift. My mom has seen this one many times and every time she sees it, she keeps telling me, oh, that would make such a great gift. I would love that, Carmen. And it's like, okay, yes, mom, I get the hint. I'll make you one. <laughs> anyway, so this is gonna be it. She's not gonna see this video. 
anyway, so that was a Smalls exchange, and I got this really cute jar <laughs> with, uh, uh, what would you call this? Like the lid is has a little stitched thing on it, and it was made by Elizabeth May, and she used uh, Fallow Red, one of my favorite reds, on, I think this is, oh, she doesn't say the count, but I'm pretty sure this is 32 count. And this is a motif from the 2018 Stitch Along, and she put, you know, MFE 23 and then EM, her initials. And of course I wanted to meet her and I took a picture with her, which I will insert. And I was at her table and I was chatting with her and, you know, I was like, what do you do? What do I do? Anyways, and I was explaining that I was a classical musician and she was like, oh, you should talk to Karen. Karen's a musician. So Karen's the woman that made the ornament. So I started to turn around, started talking to Karen and Karen is a music theory teacher and a piano teacher and she corrected the RCM exams like this is all like really nitty-gritty nerdy classical music stuff and she's from London and as she's talking I'm thinking I wonder if she knows Fiona so I have this old roommate that I lived with when I was living and studying in Montreal her name is Fiona she's also a cellist and she's from London and she did a minor in music theory and she also played piano very very well and she was talking and I was like you know, the classical music world is like kind of small, especially in Canada, like people kind of know each other. And so I just asked her like, hey, um, do you know who Fiona last name is? And she was like, oh yeah, she's a cellist. She lives in Paris now, blah, 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 blah. And I kind of had to interrupt her and I was like, I'm sorry, Fiona and I like lived together for three years and she's one of my very, very good friends. So yeah, Fiona used to study with her and I think Karen is like friends with Fiona's family and like goes to their house sometimes. <laughs> And I'm like very good friends with Fiona. So <laughs> and then I asked her if she knew who my music theory teacher was from when I was in high school and they, they also know each other. So I got a picture with Karen and I sent it to Fiona with zero context. And Fiona was very confused and probably assumed that we were at some kind of music related conference, but no, we were at a cross stitch retreat. Anyways, so very small world. And actually later I was talking to Caroline and I was telling her this story and then I remembered that Caroline was also a flute teacher and has links to classical music in London. So I was like, wait, do you know Fiona? And Caroline was like, oh yeah, the cellist. So yeah, even Caroline knew who Fiona was. So everybody at this retreat knows Fiona. <laughs> Fiona should have come. I don't think she cross stitches. She does knit and she did knit me a pair of socks once, which was very cool. Anyway, so that was kind of cool. Ooh, and then, then we learned how to make a hem stitch. And this is where I went ham. So I'm gonna pull out my hem stitch thing. So we finally had to take out our hem stitch booklet and Jacob had made a video that was projected where he showed how he was doing it. And he mentioned that there was gonna be like a mirror image version of it on his website for left-handed people. Uh, so that makes me think that maybe that video is on his website. I should check because it was a very easy to follow video and he was also explaining how it worked and we had that piece of 32 count linen which we were supposed to use to, to practice this and I managed to do it while I was there and as I mentioned I did not use the just navy floss that was given to us because that is just too precious to waste on something like this so I used some DMC that I had and it looks really weird with red floss uh, but I did manage to do it and there are a couple little boo-boos that I made but this was great practice and after we were doing it he was going around the room and asking people and people were asking him questions and he was just helping people and telling them they did a great job and he's very he's very nice and encouraging I don't think he had a bad thing to say about anything or anyone he's a lovely person anyways so I finished this while I was there um, something I've been wanting to learn how to do for a while Avleia Folk Embroidery has a video on, on her channel where she explains how to do this, but she does it in a different way. Uh, and he talked about, like I think mitered edges is what it's called. Apparently that's not typical. So you do kind of have like these cushiony corners. And I asked him about this, I think it was the previous night, like how do you, how, what do you do with this once it's done? And he said that, you know, you might like wrap it up and put it in a basket. You're not necessarily framing it, but that you can frame it and how that works is that it would be like sewn onto a piece of another piece of fabric 
and that that piece of fabric is what would then be pinned and laced onto a piece of foam board. And that this kind of creates like, it, instead of a mat, it, it creates that same effect of a mat, that it is just like a fabric border around the piece. Anyways, it's actually really not that hard. It took like a minute to kind of wrap my mind around how to do it. And of course it's like a little scary to um, pull threads, especially if you've already stitched something. Like I don't really care if I mess this up because it's just scraps. But yeah, it'll take maybe a little bit of courage to do this to your finished piece. But he explained also that usually uh, this would be the first step. You would do this before any of the stitching and then you would stitch on it. So, and that's why there are things that are maybe not perfectly centered and sometimes the stitches go over the border because they miscalculated how much space they had. Uh, so anyways, and actually he was working on something. He was stitching something, which I'm gonna talk about in just a moment, a very exciting project that came out while we were at weekend two. And he had actually already cut the threads. He hadn't done the hem yet, it was in a frame, but he had cut the threads already. So I guess he counted really carefully before he even started stitching, uh, which is an interesting way of doing it. I don't think I would do it that way because I don't trust that I would be able to count properly. <laughs> but I guess it does take the pressure out of accidentally cutting the wrong thread once you've already spent all of those hours stitching something. Anyway, so that was what I did. But I noticed on my second favorite antique, and I'll insert a close-up picture of the border there, that there were actually two rows of holes. So when I got home, I still had a little bit of extra 32 count linen, and I studied those pictures and I kind of figured it out. And this time I used white thread, so it looks a lot nicer. And it is almost the same thing, but I, I did this extra second step where I wrapped the thread around the bottom row and then I uh, like I was going back and forth between the two rows and what that ended up doing and you can tell especially in the corners because those squares are really wonky that it sort of warped the linen threads and like they don't they, they're like the holes should not be one on top of the other they should kind of be staggered and because I did that second step it kind of like pulled the threads in a weird way so anyways, I didn't have any more 32 count linen, but I just skipped that second step with this swatch. I have a few swatches to show you. <laughs> I've been really having fun with this hem stitch, and I skipped that second step. Less work and looks better. Uh, and it's essentially the same thing. If you know how to do the hem stitch Jacob's way, you just pull out two rows of, of threads and you wrap around. Uh, it's hard to explain, but you wrap around this the inner edge and then when you do the second step you wrap around the outer edge whereas with the original you're wrapping around the same row of holes. I don't know how to explain this. Anyway, so I figured that out. I was very proud of that because I think this would be a really nice finish on something that doesn't have much of a border at all. Like there are samplers that don't have any border at all. And then this is nice because it kind of substitutes for that. Whereas something that maybe already does have a border doesn't need that extra embellishment. So this is a swatch that I also did that has just the classic hem stitch that he showed us, but with white thread now instead of the red thread. And that would be also really nice. And I really want to try this on something that I finished that maybe I don't care that much about just in case, just in case I mess it up. <laughs> but yeah, so I did that. And then on the last day he had a table of his own his own stitching and I noticed that there was a different kind of finishing that he had done on some of those that I was very interested in and I'll sh insert a close-up picture of that and that is scarier because you're really cutting very close to the edge of your stitching so if you make a boo-boo there you're in big trouble like there's no going back at least with the other hem there's like you know an inch of fabric that you can mess around with, but this it's like you're a few threads from the end of your stitching. But I was very brave and I managed to figure out how to do that too. So this is the weird corner, so I'll cover that one up. But yeah, that's how that works. I managed to figure it out. Um, I, again, don't know that I would have the guts to actually do this on any of my finished pieces because imagine your stitching goes all the way to there and you have like four or five threads of wiggle room. That's that takes some bravery. 
And then I did a variation of that where I just like didn't cut the threads all the way and so you end up with this fringe just for fun. Uh, I think this could look cool on something but I also think it might be a little bit tacky. <laughs> I don't know. Also maybe like the linen threads would get kind of fluffy after a while so I don't know. It was just for fun. I made some swatches. I'm gonna keep these just to like look at and study and I also don't want to forget how to do the hem stitch if I don't do it for a while. Anyways, that was the hem stitch. And then after that, we did the Frisian letter um, workshop. And again, I think I mentioned this in the very beginning, but it was more so how to, how to design them. And I, I mean, I won't go into too much detail because uh, it's kind of hard to explain. But again, this, this book is so clear nice big pictures, lots of examples of different letters. He gives an alphabet, explains that like all of these letters, like they're built of like little pixels. And then you, you blow those pixels up instead of a one X, you turn it into like a block of four X's and then you outline it. And then these are like the typical embellishments, but they're also like little swirlies and little X's. And like, sometimes it's made out of eyelets and just explains all the different ways that you can you can build these and like really the possibilities are endless because it's just these very basic building blocks and then you outline it and then you use these different kinds of embellishments and then he also provided a lot of ways that you can those little pixels that you can stitch those in different interesting ways and use different colors and stuff like that anyways very interesting possibilities are limitless um and yeah, at the end of the day, it's it's mostly just crosses and some backstitch, so it's not a difficult thing to to stitch. I mean, a lot of the examples here also have eyelets, but you don't have to do that. But eyelets are fun. I like eyelets. <laughs> I only stitched them once, but I had a great time. The next thing I want to talk about... Okay, so then Caroline took the stand and started telling a story about Laura from Brenda and the Serial Starter from the previous week. And if you've seen other floss tubes, you might already know this story, but briefly, uh, Jacob helped her to find a, um, an antique sampler that is from Friesland. And uh, it's like her first sampler. I think he actually bought it for her as a gift, which is a very nice gift. Oh my goodness. Um, and she actually brought it to weekend one. So I wasn't there for any of this, but while he was there, he charted it and reproduced it. And Caroline uh, had already been running a fundraising effort for two charts, the AIO, which is actually, it's, it's this one, as well as Love Gains. And I think all the proceeds from that were going to uh, a, a church that is next to the Evertote workshop that uh, lets them use their parking lot. And she's noticed that they're like feeding the poor and just doing a lot of work and being very humble about it. And she was very touched by that and wanted to, to find an opportunity to raise some money for them so that they could you know, continue that, which is, is beautiful and wonderful that she thought to do that. So she was already raising money um, by selling those charts. But then in weekend two, they decided that this chart that Jacob had just charted uh, based on Laura's Frisian sampler, all the proceeds of that would also go towards um, that fundraising effort. So, of course, everyone then ran to the cash register and ordered it. It's a PDF, and it's it's now available for everyone on the Evertote website. And there was also a floss pack, which I obviously got. <laughs> so this is my second bunch of floss. And actually, the linen that he chose to stitch it on is the new Speculas linen. So this piece of Speculas that I bought the previous day is what this will be stitched on and it's gonna be beautiful. And that piece that Jacob was working on was this Frisian sampler and I think he was about halfway done and he was stitching it on on this linen and it was it's beautiful and charming and it was a really nice opportunity to, you know, spend money but feel good about it, you know? <laughs> so I will be stitching that pretty soon. It's not a big sampler at all. I think I could get that out pretty quickly. Another thing I bought on day two was this piece of linen. I think this is called candy apple. Um, 
40 count, another uh, quarter yard. And this is a linen I would have never bought, but Nancy, who was sitting at my table right next to me, and I will insert a picture here, in the Smalls Exchange, she got this little red ornament and it was so cute and beautiful. And I was like, oh my goodness, I wanna make 20 of those and put them on a tree. Imagine 20 of those on a Christmas tree. Anyways, but you need a red linen, right? So I got red linen. <laughs> I would never have bought this otherwise. It was, again, being in a room with people and seeing other people's finishes gives you ideas and I will be making that ornament. Maybe not this Christmas, or maybe I'll make them throughout the year next year, and then I'll have them as gifts for people. But this is a beautiful linen for Christmas ornaments. See, I'm always thinking about doing samplers, and I wouldn't do a sampler on this. But yeah, sometimes you gotta make ornaments as gifts. I've done that plenty of times. And then it's great to have this gorgeous, like, cherry red, like, maraschino cherry. I love it. Anyways, so ornaments will be made with this. I have to figure out how to finish that heart, but that's another Jacob chart and I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure that out. The other thing I bought, and this is the last thing I bought on day two, because I was a little bit more frugal, <laughs> I guess. I also got this project bag. And this is the same pattern of linen, or sorry, of fabric um, that the thread bed was made from, but this has a different colorway white and beige and this is beige and black and I saw this on the website a while ago and thought it was beautiful I used to do a lot of lino cut printmaking and this kind of design is it looks like block print it's beautiful and of course it comes with a little notions pouch and it's actually a little bit bigger than the other project bags that I have the other project I have three actually you know what I have them right here I'll show them to you they're all from Evertote so this is, I think it's called Loon Toss. They were selling these and then by the end of the weekend there weren't any at the table. So I don't know if they're sold out or they just sold all the ones that they brought. But here you can see, same width, um, but a little bit higher, a little bit longer, sorry. And you know, this fits my 10 inch Q-snap in it, but it's very tight. Um, and this just has a bit more space. So I really like this size. Um, and just in case you're curious, the other bag that I have, I forget the name of this one, but it was it was on sale on their website a little while ago. And same thing. So I now have three bags and they're all ever tote bags. So I clearly have a shop and a designer that I really like. Honestly, this whole retreat and everything about it just felt like fate for me. Um, when I started cross stitching again, uh, it was about a year ago and I, I was interested in cross-stitching because I liked the activity, the process of it, but I also, what I stitched when I was a kid was like, I feel like they were maybe Dimensions kits or something, I don't know exactly, but they came from Michael's, little kits of like an animal, you know, backstitched in black, and I just wasn't really into those kinds of designs, and I think had I known that stuff like this existed, I probably would have kept going, but I just, I wasn't into that, that kind of subject matter anymore, I grew out of it. It felt a little bit, I don't know, I guess a little childish. And then I was a teenager and lost interest in that kind of stuff. But anyways, when I got back into it a year ago, I was like, I'm sure that there is somebody on YouTube talking about cross-stitch. Like, there is a community for every little niche art form on the internet somewhere. You just got to find it. So I almost like was looking for floss tube before I even knew what floss tube was. Um, so eventually I found some people talking about it and then... Very quickly, I got a, in my recommended videos, a video of, of Jacob's. Um, and it was actually the name of his channel that got my attention, Modern Folk Embroidery. So I was like, that's exactly what I'm interested in. I'm like interested in heritage folk designs for the modern person. So I think even before watching his videos, I just Googled Modern Folk Embroidery, ended up on his website. And like, just my jaw hit the floor. I was like, yes, this, this is what I want. Like, this is totally up my alley. It's a combination of antiques. And that's when I started to become interested in, in, in antique samplers. And he had so many Dutch ones. Of course, I didn't know he was Dutch quite yet. And actually the sampler that made me be like, oh my God, I need to make that was in the Garden of Holland. 
and it like stuck with me for so long was this one just any opportunity to show this again <laughs> so I saw the model of this on his website and was like whoa like I one day I'm gonna make that and in my mind I was like this is super advanced and I, I'll need to practice for five years before I can make it At the end of the day it's just crosses there's there's no specialty stitches or anything like that in this it's a lot of colors and it's not small this is 40 count but it's not it's not difficult at all if you know how to cross stitch you can you can make that and then I watched one of his videos and I could hear right away from his accent I'm like this is a Dutch man and he has so many Dutch samplers and it I don't know just it, it felt really meant to be and then I also discovered different like dyers and stuff and then there was this one that seemed really interesting to me called Evertote and Roxy Floss and I was like oh they're kind of local to me what the heck and I mean London isn't that close to where I, I live in Quebec so it, it, it is a bit of a journey to get out there but it's it's somewhat local comparatively and then it turns out that they have a really close relationship with my favorite designer of all time like everything just it was a little spooky how perfect everything felt anyways so very grateful for for all of these coincidences and then I was able to go and that I had a friend nearby who was able to like give me a ride and stuff and then Karen was there and we both know Fiona and Caroline knows Fiona anyways it was it was very very special oh there's one last thing so Jacob was walking around and that was when I was able to show him my finishes and actually my table mates were really nice about this because they're like you should show him this you should show him that because they knew how excited I was to be there but I didn't want to be like fangirling or anything so I was encouraged to show him some of my finishes and I think he was really I, I, I think he really really liked this one and anyway so I got a selfie with him and I'll insert that and I'm holding my big Freelanza sampler and also while I was talking to him about about my finishes my table mates were very sneaky and took some pictures of us but I'm very grateful to have those pictures I you know this is just a special moment for me and felt like a bit of a full circle moment too so I will now what will I insert here I will insert now uh, the photos of the models um, and then I will come back to talk about the third and sad final day of the retreat. All right, day three. Again, my friend graciously drove me to the convention center and again I was one of the last people to arrive but I did manage to get there this was the shortest day uh, we finished at noon and this I feel like was the first day where I actually like had the guts to like go and talk to people a bit more so this was the day where I um, talked to Shiloh a bit more when I discovered that we were both half Italian and Dutch and when I gave her my conversion for in the Garden of, of Holland and you know super flattered about that but also I had been talking to Carrie about a conversion for this red stag sampler that I wanted to do and she had earlier in during the retreat she had made a conversion for someone but I think she like didn't write it down or she took a picture of the flosses but it wasn't quite correct anyway so there was a bit of um confusion over which flosses I should have but I ended up buying first of all half a yard of panettone because because just because <laughs> you need to you know how, you need to have panettone but I also uh, bought I think in the end it was 16 skeins of floss for the conversion for red stag and uh, and then I got to my table and I wanted to figure out which floss corresponded with which DMC color and I was having a hard time figuring it out. I am very glad that I checked because it turns out that what I had bought wasn't quite right. So I went to her and I asked, like, I, well, I can't figure out what, what corresponds to what, so can you help me with that? And it turns out that, I don't know if, I don't know exactly what happened, but I bought, first of all, too much floss and not quite the right um, colors. So anyways, we went through all of that and fixed some things and in the end, um, 
I ended up with a couple of extra skeins of floss that I was able to just like exchange for whatever other color I wanted. Anyway, so this is the color palette for um, the red stag among the roses. And again, I'm going to try to set these up so you can actually see them all. A little bit hard. And Evertote has a conversion because I actually emailed Caroline when I got home because I was like, maybe you guys, like, because I know that Carrie hadn't written it down. Um, so I was like, in case you want this conversion that Carrie spent all this time making for me, here it is. <laughs> Um, and then she she told me that um, they had actually made another conversion that was slightly different because I think there are some one of a kinds in here. But anyways, uh, I'm sure they're all equally great. So these are the colors. And uh, again, it's like getting a little bit washed out with this light, but they are so nice. They are so nice. Oh, that's really, really washed out. The brights are very washed out but these ones are pretty accurate, but like, yeah, this like, ah, it's frustrating. But anyways, in the original bunch of flosses that I had bought was this color, which is called Goody Blue Shoes and also powdered up, which did remain in the floss pack. And these two colors, oh, when she pulled them off, I like grabbed them and I was like, oh, these colors are so pretty together. And she said that they're like part of the same like color family. And oh, I really hope that it shows up properly. Okay, if I stand a little bit further back, it's a little better. But these two colors alone are so pretty. So in the end, when I had extra skeins that I could exchange, I, I ended up just kit, I almost said kissing this one. I ended up keeping it. I did not kiss it. Not at the retreat. I'm just kidding. I didn't. I have not kissed any skeins of floss in my life. <laughs> Anyways, I kept it because it's so pretty, and I feel like there are so many Jacob charts that are like even like his stitch along for this year. Like imagine that in these two colors. Like this. Oops, it's upside down. Like imagine these two instead. These two colors that really complement each other. This. I'm, I'm all about these colors. So this blue is kind of, I would describe it as like a greenish grayish blue and quite unsaturated and obviously in two different shades, darker and lighter one. Um, but it's very, a very cool blue. It, it's sort of accurate. This is sort of accurate to what the colors are, but yeah, beautiful, just beautiful. I don't know what I'm going to use this skein of floss for but I wanted to keep it anyways because it's really nice. Anyway, so there was a question and answer period um, with Jacob. In the last you know, hour or so of the retreat, I wanted to go up to the front and say goodbye to the antiques one last time, but to my surprise, they weren't there and actually instead were a bunch of his finished works as well as a couple of whips that he had. And I took a little video of that when nobody was around. <laughs> And I will insert that here. Oh my god. 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 Oh my
He had changed all of the things that were Yeah, I was gonna visit the antiques and I was like, wait a second. So one of the finished samplers that was on this table that I didn't recognize but loved was the Charlotte Ramsey sampler and I'll insert a photo of that here and I asked Jacob like is this like a new pattern or something like, I don't recognize this and it's so nice and he said yeah that pattern like was not as popular and he thinks that or he said he thought it was probably because the cover art was not as good quality as some of the other ones and it's like a little bit what I was talking about earlier when I was mentioning the Swedish folk pillow there are so many of Jacob's charts that people are just sleeping on and I think Charlotte Ramsey would appeal to a very large number of people I think it would pair really nicely with Joan Sands um, so if you like Joan Sands maybe look at Charlotte Ramsey it's, it's a great one I definitely want to do that one and I feel like I have a lot of colors in stash that would work for that like I would maybe make my own conversion and I think I would use a lot of the same colors that I used for in the Garden of Holland anyway so that was the last the last moments uh, at the convention center and I got to say lots of nice things to Jacob and I'm I'm just yeah I'm very grateful that I was able to do this and I watched um, Caroline's recent video and she, that she did with Jacob when he was still in town and they said well maybe they would want to do it like in five years or something and Jacob when he was when I was talking to him also said like that this was great he wishes that there was a third weekend like he wants to do this kind of thing again so that's very promising I really hope that if they come back to um, London that I'll be able to go again because it was it was a perfect weekend I feel like everything worked out exactly how it was supposed to I think I'm so lucky that there is a needle workshop not so far from me that I'm really really enthusiastic about and the people there are lovely oh I wanted to talk about Daniel for a moment <laughs> so Daniel has shown up in Caroline's videos a few times and he I think he's the one who makes most of the project bags but he also cuts the linen and he was there cutting linen and when I was buying uh, the, the the conversion for red stag on the third day I happened to mention to him and Carrie that I'm not crazy about my scissors and I'm looking for I'm looking for new scissors and oh my goodness I mentioned scissors to the right person <laughs> he went on and on about all these things about scissors and it's like there's nothing in the world that is better than listening to someone talk about something you don't know very much about but they're really into it and he knows so much about scissors and he had so much to say and apparently he really recommends Bowen scissors uh, and the like knockoff Bowens are DMCs the DMCs are just fine and they're great for traveling because if they get confiscated it's not the end of the world because they're not that expensive but then he was talking about this person in France who makes scissors and he's like the last person in the world who's like making them by hand and 
he has two pairs and he went in his phone and he like went all the way back to try and find a picture of them and they come in this little wooden box and they're so nice and he has to be careful and he only uses them once in a while oh my goodness it was what a delightful man i was also talking to him about speculas daniel was like the the surprise star of the show like the person that i wasn't expecting to like be all excited about but he is lovely like imagine going to work every day and you get to hang out with someone like daniel oh he's the best <laughs> and honestly everyone at Evertoe was really nice but i don't know he just he, he i i i i really like found him to be just like so charming and lovely <laughs> anyway so if you ever meet daniel just find a way to like find an excuse to bring up scissors haphazardly and you will be in for a treat and you will find a passion for scissors you didn't know you had anyways <laughs> so we took some pictures as a group on day two and three because not everyone could be there for each picture so i'll insert both of those back to back um that's kind of the end of my big spiel i think i think this video is going to be close to two hours if not longer i'm gonna finish the video with a slideshow of Jacob's uh, finishes, like just better pictures of, of each of them. And, you know, just lastly, I'm very grateful for this experience. I know I've said that a million times already. Everything worked out perfectly. I learned a lot. I had a lot of like very heartfelt moments, especially like the highlight for me was learning about this sampler from Brenta on the first day and meeting Jacob and everyone on the team and my table mates that were so lovely. I just, I just feel so lucky that I was able to have that experience. And, you know, I don't know if I will, if and when I will be able to go to re a retreat again. I hope I will be able to. Um, it's, it's not the cheapest thing to do. And as for floss tube videos, Really, I made this video for myself and hopefully there's someone out there who will appreciate it. I know that I really appreciate it when other floss tubers put out detailed videos about their experiences at retreats because then I get to kind of live vicariously through them and feel like I got a little morsel of the retreat experience from watching their videos. So if you hoped to have been able to go but weren't able to, I hope this video let you live that experience a little bit. And with that, thanks for watching to the end if you made it this far. <laughs> and enjoy this slideshow. And see you later. Bye!